Good evening. Welcome to our night of touch school. And we will be looking at 1 Thessalonians, Paul's letter to the church at Thessalonica. And we will finish up where our pastor left off on the third chapter, 11 through 13 verse, and then we will get into the fourth chapter. Let us pray. Eternal God, our Father, our Creator, our Maker, our Sustainer of life, we give a very good and perfect gift. We come to you now to study you out of your word. We pray even now that this word will take root in our hearts, that we may know how to love one another. Most of all, to love you and do those things that please in your sight. It's in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Paul writes this epistle on his second missionary journey. And the purpose of writing this letter was, and he wanted them to be commended for how they withstood the temptations of the devil. And also they was examples of steadfast faith to other believers. And that's why we have to make sure that we walk circumspectively in front of those who are not in Christ, that they might want to be in Christ. The Bible talks about us being living epistles read a man. And they are not reading your sports page, they are not reading Ann Landers. So we are living epistles read a man, and it's not written with ink, but with the spirit of living God. It is not written on tables of stones, but the fleshly tables of our heart. It's not like the Mosaic law written on stones, it's writ written in our hearts. It's not external, but it is internal. And the next thing he wanted to do, to tell us we are to let our light shine before men that they may see our good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven. I believe that if your light shines on Sunday, it should be just blinking on Mondays through Saturdays. Because the same God that sees you on Sunday is the same God that sees you on Monday through Saturdays. And then the one thing we have to realize, our light describes our essential mission of the Christian to the world. We don't put our light on a bushel, but we let it shine that men may see what we are, how we are walking for Christ, how we are living to love one another. This is when we let our light shine. And also he writes to admonish them to keep themselves from immoral practices. Those were practices of the heathen because this was largely overwhelming a Gentile church. And they had all kind of cultures, immorality before they accepted Christ. So he wanted to remind them to keep up the good work. And the most impressive thing that he wanted to do in this epistle was to real, reveal information about the second coming of Christ. And this is something that they was having problem with, not knowing what to do and what to expect for the second coming of Christ. So when we get into this uh, lesson, we're going to look at verse 11 first. 
and we're going to finish 11, 12, and 13, then we will get into uh, chapter 4. Verse 11 says, Now God himself and our Father and Lord Jesus Christ direct our way unto you. He had asked for himself that God would direct his path back to them. And he prayed for this to happen. And he must however leave his desire in the hands of the God our Heavenly Father because only he can direct our path. And he also asked for them that the Lord may cause their love to continue and grow in all limits both among themselves and towards the outside of the church. Even though this was a loving church, but there was still more that they could do. There's always more that we can do with the love that we have. We can do even better because there's some things that we should love even more than we love even at this present time in our life. So it's not a finished product. We can always do more, love more, and treat others with more courtesy and respect, especially the body of Christ. Verse 12 says, And the Lord make you increase and abound in love towards another and towards all men even as we do towards you. It talks about it in Galatians that we are to do good to all men, especially those that are the household of faith. If you're going to do good to anybody, make sure you do good and bless those that is of the household of faith. Now, so we are to grow beyond what we are at. If we don't grow, there's something wrong. So we need to grow in love each and every day. That's not, we are not at our limit. And uh, verse 13 said, Paul, it talks about, to the end he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ with all saints. This is the purpose of which Paul prays and directs that we be established, support an existing structure. You already established, but you need to support your establishment. Support it even more. Just to keep building on your existing structure. And here, the personal fate of the Thessalonians is in view. The desire is that they will be strengthened in holiness as they wait for the coming Savior. That's for the second coming of the Lord. We are to wait in holiness. And holiness is being set aside, not set apart for the Lord's use. So we are to be holy because he is holy. And he tells us to be holy because he is holy. And holy is, is a term that we used to think that was it applies to people in other churches. And even today we think that holiness is just for preachers, deacons, and teachers. But I remind you that holiness is for every Christian who has accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Because love is the identifying mark of the Christian. The Bible talks about how can you love God and hate your brother? It talks about you being a lie. But how can you love God who you haven't seen, but you see your brother every day and you hate him? That seems to contradict your love for your fellow man and for your love of God. 
So, this is also, and Paul uses what has become a Christian term for the second coming. And it is qualified here by the phrase, with all saints, which is proved. And this refers to holy persons, namely believers. So this is what we are looking at here, is Paul's desire and he praying for the, not only the church at Thessalonica, but he praying that he will one day join them again. So this is, and we are going to go into chapter 4. And when we look at chapter 4, Paul is getting down to the real nitty gritty. He's getting down to business. In other words, this is practical theology. And we have been in class long enough. Now, it's time to practice what you preach. If we stay, we have, we listen to sermons every Sunday, we come to Sunday school, we go to Bible class, and we have learned enough to make it through. It's not that we need to know so much more, it's that we need to do what we already know. We can start off with love one another, because love is the key. So we, it's time to leave the classroom and practice what you've been taught, how we should live. How one should live, God has already put it in his word, how the Christians is to behave. So he says in chapter four, and this is all practical exhortations. Furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus Christ that as we have received of us how you ought to walk and to please God, so we would abound more and more. Paul had already told them in his epistles how they should walk and how they should walk to please God and not themselves. A lot of people want to please someone else and especially themselves. But our walk is to please God and that's the very nature of the Christian is to please God. Doing things that is well pleasing in his sight. And so he beseeches them, he's asking them he is encouraging them that they are already living according to the Christian standard, but continue to grow. Our Christian to walk is not a 12th grade education. It's not a college education. It's not a PhD, but it is a continuation process until Christ comes back. So we are to continue to grow in grace, and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That's why we should be uh, encouraged by the words that Paul is saying to us. And he's, and this is the, one of the main points of the letter. And now Paul gets down to business here. He tells us how we should live. And I said again, this section is on practical theology. And it's, it's especially important for the Thessalonian Gentile because they had no Jewish background and they had no customary moral tradition like the Jews because they was they was had brought up in a different culture, sexual impurity was a thing that they always done and all other immoral things before they got saved in Christ. And he's speaking to the church. He's not speaking to the sinner, but he's speaking to the church, how the church is supposed to act. 
Verse 2 says, For we know what commandment we gave you by the Lord Jesus. In verses 1 through 8, our walk tells us how we are to live and please God. It talks about sanctification. And the church was composed of these Gentiles. And since they didn't have any moral laws like the Jews, they had to be taught those things. The word commandment shows that these exhortations to purify are Christian moral standards. And they are not to be taken lightly. We don't talk about a lot of morality in this day and time. Everybody does what he wants to do. And, and we become immune to the fact that so much is going on that we think that is right. But I remind you that right is right if nobody is doing it. And wrong is wrong if everybody is doing it. Because we are not to be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing, renewing of our minds. Holy conversation. And we don't act like, we shouldn't act like we did before we accepted Christ. There must be a change in our life. So holy living in an unholy world, that's what we are living in. Holy living in an unholy world, how do we sustain? It is our Christian hobby that we do whatever we have time for. Or do we take our faith seriously? Is your Christianity something you do? Or is it who we are? We are called to holiness. So sanctification is a process of making one holy. And that is a continual process of doing sanctification. And I want to remind you that sanctification is not automatic. It is a matter of constant consciousness, obedient to the command of Christ. When Christ give us a command, it's not a thought. It's not something that we do like a buffet. We take part of the scripture and make it fit our own, but his commandments are true. And he expects us to live by our, his commandments. And they are not grievous because we can live by his commandments in which he wants us to do. And when we know what Christ expects of us, you have to put it in practice. Now you know what it is to be holy if you've been coming to church for some years. Then why aren't you putting it into practice? We have to practice what we preach Remember that we are living epistles, great of men. And whenever the church or the body of Christ do something and that can make the outside world frown on us, or laugh at us, we give Christianity a black eye because we should be living a life that's pleasing to God, our Father. So we already know more about God's word than we are practicing. And we need to do what we already know. I don't think there's nobody in the church that's been coming to Sunday school, that's been coming to uh, worship service, don't know enough about the word of God. So we need to practice what we already know. And uh, you don't need a whole lot of more but do what you already know, start with that, and then continue to grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 
It says, verse 3 said, this is the will of God. Even your sanctification that you should abstain from fornication. Now, most churches don't preach about fornication. Why, well, I don't know. And that's one of the main things that's happening in our society today. Fornification. And it's, it's just not uh, a person who's cheating on his wife. It's all kind of immoral, illicit sins, sexual sins, pornography. Not only just cheating on your spouse. And when you cheat on your spouse, you do your body harm. So then we are to practice this morality. And Christian moral standards, he is acting as Jesus Christ's representative. That's what Paul is doing. He's an ambassador for Jesus Christ, and he has this apostolic ministry that he can say those things because he's speaking on behalf of Jesus Christ. When you speak some, to someone, you should speak on behalf of Jesus Christ because it's his word that you're speaking, and his word has power. There's power in the word of God. There's power in the gospel. And so he wants us to uh, get in the will of God and, and sustain from fundification. What is fundification? It is a general word, and it's all kinds of illicit sexual intercourse, prostitute, premarital sex, adultery. And this is the negative side of sanctification. When he tells his reader to abstain, means to keep oneself entirely away from it. In other words, you can't go halfway. You've got to go all the way. Sustain from fornication, illicit sex. And every time we look at the TV, there's some, mostly sex is involved with some kind of lady or whatever, and she's dressing to get your attention. But that's the way the world is. The devil wants you to engage in illicit uh, fornication, illicit sex, whatever, and he wants you to do it with somebody else because he knows that that's not God's way. So we have to take note that that is not God's way. Verse 4 says, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. Each of us should know how to take a wife for himself in holiness and honor. This word vessel is used of a wife as a wicker vessel. And Paul talks about the woman being the wicked vessel when he compared to what happened in the Garden of Eden. Satan goes to the woman, and she is a wicked vessel, not that she's weak-minded, but she's a weak vessel, because that's who the devil wants to attack, the wicked vessel. And, and uh, so we are to be sanctified in our marriage, and it was something brand new for the Thessalonians because they had come from this corrupt Gentile culture. They grew up not knowing God, and now they had turned to God. They needed to know and conform to Christian standards. Once you come out the world, you have to be transformed from your old life until your new life. Because the world standards don't work with God standards. If you love the world and the things of the world, you can't love God. You can't love two masters the same. Verse five said, not in lust of concupiscence 
as a Gentile which not with no not God. So they wasn't brought up in this culture. Even in the church, we have people brought up in different cultures. And when they come to Christ, a lot of them don't want to change. They want to stay in the same culture that they, they came out of. But you can't bring the world into the church and expect for the church to operate the way God wants it to operate. Those worldly things will not work in the church. So we have to recognize that God is teaching us through his spirit how we are to behave, how we are to walk. And verse 6 said that no man go beyond the fraud and the fraud his brother in any manner because that the Lord is the avenger of all such as we also have forewarned you and testified. Now, first, go beyond means to overstep or break a law. And it also, it does, it does break this moral law, a man will, by that very fact, defraud his brother, take advantage of him, robbing or cheating someone through greed. And we have a lot of greed today. People robbing, stealing, just because of greed. And they have all that they need, but they still want more. And he, when he does this, you, you are robbing, or defrauding your brother, because if you're in Christ, he in Christ, he is your brother. And you shouldn't defraud him, or do anything robbing or cheating him. Now, this comment is also needed on the phrase, in any manner. So, the construction of the language of the New Testament allows only one meaning. It is not just any matter that is in view, but specific this matter which has been mentioned, that is, unethical sexual activity. The sense of this passage is then that instead of commit, committing adultery with someone else, he must know that he has violated or robbed his brother by doing so, and that he deserved the vengeance of God. To show the seriousness of God's vengeance, we got to be careful when we rob or we, uh, of our brother, violates his his wife, or whatever it is. That's not a feeling, and God will venge that person for him. God will do it himself. And so we don't have to, we have to go beyond, and we don't have to overstep or break any law. Don't take advantage of someone because they don't have what you have. And a lot of people like to especially when it comes to women and those that think that they are big shots, that they can buy uh, or give any woman something that they want. And they know that that's their brother. He don't have as much as you have. And he can't buy those things that you buy. And if she get caught up in the fact that you will give her fine jewelry and get her hair fixed and her nails fixed every day, you will defraud your own husband. But it is God who's telling the man, don't default your brother. Now, verse 8 says, He therefore that despises, despises not man, but God who has also given us his Holy Spirit. Now, Paul here seems to allude to the a saying of Jesus recorded in Luke 10 where Jesus gave authority to the apostles and literally explained whoever obeys you 
obeys me. And whosoever rejects me, that person who rejects me, rejects the one who sent me. And that's why when we apostles preaching are giving out uh, the word of God to the people of God, and they reject the pastor's theology of concerning the word of God, they're not really rejecting the pastor. They are rejecting God because God has, to, has said it and this is what he wants done. So we have to make sure. So we have to make sure that we have love for one another. Make sure that we pray for one another. And this is things that we do according to the household of faith. Don't think that you have arrived that you have done all that you can do. There's a lot more that you can do. Just start off with love. And I don't think you need to read a thousand books to know what to do. Do what you already know. What do you know about living a life pleasing to God? What do you know about sanctification, setting yourself apart for God's use? Because God wants to use us but then our vessels is not clean. And he don't want to dwell in an unclean temple. So we have to be ready to be used by God. We don't, we have came out of the world, but don't go back. Continue in the faith. Hold on to the faith that brought us through and faith will carry us through. So this is what Paul is saying Flee fun and forgetting. Flee illicit sex. Flee those things. Because once you do those things, you are doing it to your own body. And you don't want to do anything to damage your whole body. So we have to, and we don't look at it like that in this day and time, but we must follow the word of God. It's not all right that you do it a little and stop, and do it a little and stop, is that you must continue in the word of God. The grass rivers and the flower fades, but the word of our Lord shall stand forever and ever. So on tonight, we leave here at the end of verse eight. We thank you for your participation, those that are watching us by social media, we pray that this word become part of our lives, that we know you know how to walk and please God. And let our light so shine before me that they may see our good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven. Let us pray. Eternal God, our Father, we thank you for the time you have allotted us to study you out of your word. We pray even now that we will know how to walk in a way that's pleasing in your sight. Helps to us to avoid illicit sexual fornication sins that will destroy our body. We pray in the name of Jesus, even the Christ, we do pray. Amen.